Amen. Amen. Good to be here this morning. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We thank God the presence of the Lord is with you wherever you are as the worship takes place, as the word is being preached. Wherever you are all over the world, Jesus is there. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the teacher in us. We trust you for utterance, and we pray for your people, and the spirit that gives wisdom and understanding, we give them wisdom and understanding of the things you wish them to know today. Let this word go forth with power. Let it produce changes and transformation in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk about priorities this morning. Amen. Let's talk about priorities, getting our priorities right and making our priorities biblical. You know, all of us who have been going to church and attending church and participating in the life of the church for a while, uh, we probably heard more than once that we should forsake all and follow Jesus. Amen. And, and, and we sing the song, the cross before me and the world behind me. And it, it, we sing it from our hearts and we feel it when we're singing it. And if I were to say to you today uh, and that you are called to sacrifice uh, pleasure and to sacrifice uh, popularity and to sacrifice even money uh, for the cause of Christ and to do God's will because Jesus must, must always be first. Most of us won't have any problem with that. If I told you you've got to sacrifice popularity, sacrifice, you say amen, and you say, Lord, help me. Uh, we'll, we, we consider that noble. We consider that honorable. And it is. But what about your family? What about your marriage? What about your children? What if I were to say to you today, if you're going to serve God, you need to sacrifice your marriage, sacrifice your family, sacrifice your children. I see some of you behind your mask already looking at me. That's our net high. Good to see you. Amen. All of you look because for you now, wait a minute, Bishop, that's, that's going too far. God told us we're supposed to love our children. We're supposed to love our family. We're supposed to love our spouse. And now you're talking about sacrifice. You're a false prophet. Okay. Let's see what Jesus had to say. Go to Luke chapter 14. Verse 25 to 26. Luke 14, 25 and 26. And there you will read. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, now let's read this together, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and his own life also. He cannot be mine. Uh oh, I know you can call me the false prophet, but you dare not call Jesus one. Those are his words. Those are his words. So, so, so we need to we need to take what he's saying seriously here. Obviously, Jesus didn't limit. And say, okay, if you want to follow me, you got to deny, sacrifice, popularity, 
sacrifice pleasure, sacrifice the things of the world. He became very specific. He went where no man ever. (laughs) He said, literally, if we are not prepared, that word hate is strong. He could have have used another word, but he said hate. Hate. Hate his father, his mother, his wife, and his children, brothers and sisters. He cannot be my disciple. So obviously, uh, Jesus calls us to a life of sacrifice that many of us really have not fully taken into account. We have not counted the cost fully. We have limited our understanding of what we're called to sacrifice, it includes, my brother and sister, your family, your spouse, even your children, which for you is probably your most precious, precious possession. So let's look at this because we've got to reckon with the scripture. We want to be obedient to Christ. He told this parable, or he made this statement after telling a parable. And this is the conclusion of the parable. So let's take a quick look at the parable itself. Uh, it's the parable that, that where Jesus says there's a king that has this uh, uh, banquet, this feast. Uh, and The king sends out an invitation to everybody to come because he has prepared for them a feast. So he invites them to come to his kingdom, come to the palace, and spend some time with him. And the Bible lets us know that one by one, those he had invited started to give excuse. One of them said, I bought me a piece of land. Please bid me excuse. I cannot come. The other one said, I have bought me a pair of oxen. And I have to go and test them. I cannot come. Please bid me excuse. Now, To paraphrase what they're saying is, I've made some decisions, business decisions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in this business. This business has great promise. We're investing in the transportation that will increase the capacity and the productivity of my business. And this is very important, and I need to make sure that this investment succeeds. The other one buys land. Who knows what he wanted to do with the land? Maybe he was going to build a house on the land. Or maybe he was going to start a farm. But he wanted to use that land profitably. Now, none of those things is wrong. In fact, they are very positive. It's a good thing to want to start a business and to invest. Good. The Bible talks about the wisdom of investing learning from the ant and planning. That is good. Nothing negative, nothing sinful, a good thing that ordinarily we will encourage. And then the third one, the third guy said, I've just married a wife. I've started a family. And I really need to spend the time right now ministering to my wife, making sure her needs are taken care of. She's a new, new, new bride, and she really, really needs me to be there with her during this time. So surely the king should understand. Please tell him to excuse me this time because I need to give priority right now to this family, to my wife, to the family. I mean, who can argue with that, right? We, we, we tell people, in counseling. Set aside time. Give quality time. Spend quality time. Make sure you prioritize your family. Prioritize your marriage. 
Attend to your marriage. That is God's will. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. We, we, we say that, right? And those are all good things. And ordinarily, you will commend someone for choosing to place a high priority on his relationship with his spouse and wanting to give quality time to his marriage. But in this parable, Jesus does not commend that attitude. In fact, the king in the story gets upset. And he calls his servant and says, you know, go and just bring everybody. Just forget about these people. He is not pleased with their decision. Even though the decision was to, to, to take care of his wife, prioritize marriage, prioritize the family, all of that. He was not pleased. He did not commend them. And that was when he then made the point that we read earlier. If you are going to follow me and you don't hate father, mother, brother, sisters, wife, children, you cannot be my disciple. So clearly... All of these things are good. Family is important. But clearly in Jesus' mind, family is not the most important thing. Obviously, Jesus is saying as wonderful as it is to, to, to invest wisely, to, to plan, and to, to give your attention to your family and to your marriage, as wonderful as it is, it sometimes, if you're not careful, can come in direct conflict with him and his plan and what he wants you to be doing with your time, your talent, and your treasure. So even as you attend to the affairs of this life, this parable says be careful because even the best of things can become a problem when you allow them to conflict with what I have called you to do and the things that I would have you to do with your life, with your time, and with your treasure. Now, there's a very popular hierarchy of priorities that a lot of Christians practice and is preached as though it's gospel. And here is the priority. God first, then family, then the church, and then other people. God, family. And when they say family, it means, okay, God, then spouse. God, then children. So it's God, if you're married, spouse. If you have children, children. And then if you got some close extended family, the close extended family, then church. And they have no problem because they assume this priority is biblical. And so all I got to do, if there's a conflict between what I feel my family needs and what the church needs, no, there's no issue. Family always comes first because that's how God designed it. No, that is how we have chosen to order our priorities to give us the freedom to do what we want to do for ourselves and for our children and for our families and to justify not taking care of God's family. That hierarchy, obviously, is not Jesus's. <laughs> On another occasion, someone said to Jesus, oh, there's your mother. Oh, there are your brothers. Jesus said, wait a minute, who, am I? who are my brothers uh, and who's my mother? He, he says, my mother, my brothers are those who do the will of the Father. So here again, Jesus obviously doesn't ascribe to or subscribe to that hierarchy. Because here he's saying, yeah, and you know he loved his mother. I mean, it wasn't that he neglected her. He took care of her. But he did not buy into that philosophy that says that, that, that 
my earthly and biological family always comes first and I need to always put them before God and God's family. And by the way, the church is his family. And when you came to Christ and you, your decision to follow Christ now has placed you in two families. There is the biological family with which you have responsibilities. All of us were born into a family and if we have created another family of our own, the biological family is real. The biological family is important. The biological family have needs and parents have responsibilities to their children and to their spouses. None of that is being denied here. The problem is when we decide that that entity always has priority and, and, and automatically requires that I give it as much of my time as I sense it needs, even at the cost of having no time left, no resources left for the spiritual family that I'm a part of. Hear me, family is important. But family doesn't always come first. You are part of two families. The biological family and then the spiritual family. I want you to quickly look at look at first first Timothy three fifteen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And I want you to read this. First Timothy let's read this together. But if I'm delayed I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in, now, the other version says, know how to conduct yourself in the family of God. That warehouse is household, family, that you may know how to conduct yourself in the family of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Maybe next week I'll spend more time just looking at the church as the family of God. But hear me, the church is his family. And all of us who have believed in him have been made members of his family. And Christ is the head of this spiritual family that all of us are a part of. And the church family, his family, was not created to serve my family. My family was brought together to be made a part of his family. And if we don't understand that, if we don't understand the importance of his family, and don't realize that my biological family was created in, and and, and brought into the church family. Not so the church family can serve my biological family, but so that my biological family can serve his family, which is the spiritual family, the church. Think about it. On one occasion, Paul said, you know, in Genesis chapter chapter. Was it what God said it's not good for men to be alone? Is that chapter three? It's not good for men to be alone. In in in, in Paul's letters into the Corinthians, Paul says not it's 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 better not to marry. <laughs> yeah, Paul said, you know what? The reality is it's not it's not good to marry. He says, when you get married, then, 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 then that can become a problem. So hear me. The point is that spiritual family is so important. And it's okay to, to, to acknowledge that we do have a responsibility to our children and to our spouses. Don't hear anything that I'm saying today as to suggest that that is not the case. What I am saying today in order to rightly relate to my biological family, I've got to understand the importance and the place that the spiritual family that I'm a part of uh, uh, holds in the mind and heart of God.
Are you here? How do you set your priorities? Are you one of those who God and then my family and then if I have anything left over in terms of time as treasure then the spiritual family or God's family, the church? Is that how you set your priorities? The danger of that is when you make that the rule that you live by, it's, it's very easy to become disobedient and to neglect the responsibilities you have to the spiritual family. You can justify that so easily. And that's why there are a lot of folks who name the name of Christ, who call themselves Christians, who don't bother to attend or participate in the life of a local church. All their time and their effort is, is spent on their family. You know, they occupy their time, they occupy their days, all the ball games, all the extracurricular activities, everything that the school offers, plus what they got to do in terms of earning a living. And they give themselves totally to that and have no time left to commit to their spiritual family. No time left to fellowship with their spiritual family. No time life left to serve the members of their spiritual family. And they have this attitude that, you know what? I can have a relationship with God, and as long as my relationship with God is okay, then it, all I need to focus now is taking care of my family. But let's be honest. Even if you live by this hierarchy, God and then your family. Tell me, how do you practicalize your love for God? What does it mean to say God is first? That you read your Bible? God is first. You pray when you have needs? God is first. You confess Jesus as your sin. Is that what it means practically to make God first? What does it mean to love God? Hmm? You say, I love God, I love God, I love God. What does that mean? Let's, let's, let's go to 1 first, first John. 1 first John chapter 3. Go to verse 14. Hmm? No, for, you know, if I go to 1 go to, go to John 4, 20 first. 1 John 4, 20, we'll come back to this one. Because you say God is first. Okay, let's make, this let's make this practical. Even if it's God first and then your family next, what does making God first mean? I love God. What does it mean? Let's read that. If, everybody, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God? How can you make God first if you don't make the members of his family first? How do you do it? If you neglect your brothers and sisters, if you neglect the family of God, how do you in actuality make God first? It's just words means nothing until you translate it into concrete action. And since you can't see God, the only way you can love God is by loving his family. You can't sit home, not participate, not commit to his family, not serve his family, not love actively the members of his family, not care to be with the members of his family and say, oh, I love you, Lord. I leave my voice. Listen, God, God, God appreciates that worship. Again, it's good, but if that's all you're doing, it's empty. I think, it's, is it Pastor Glady? Is that her song? I don't want to sing empty songs to you. Go back to 1 John 3, 14. Okay, God is first, my family is second. Well, let's see what it means. Together, we know that we have passed from death to life because what? Is it because we love God? 
Now, we love God, but how do we love God? By loving his children, our brothers and sisters. By brethren there, he's talking about your church family. So if I'm putting God first, I've got to be putting his children first, his family first. He who does not love his brother, oh, no, I love everybody. Empty words. Let's keep reading. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding him. Keep going. But this we, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Now, remember, he's not defining what love for God is and what love for the brethren is. He's saying it's not words. It's not love because you say, I love the brethren. It's only love when it's followed by sacrificial action, by acts of service, acts of love, where we prefer one another and where we sacrifice for one another. And he says, Jesus is an example. When Jesus said, I love you, he went to the cross and died for you. It was not just words. When Jesus said, I love you, he left heaven and came to earth where you were, and he gave himself for you. When Jesus said, I love you, he put on a towel and washed your feet. It's not love if it's only words. That's what he's saying. Jesus sacrificed for you and me, for the family. He said, now we also ought to do what? Lay down, sacrifice for the brethren. Brothers and sisters, we are not doing God's will if our focus is only on our biological family and the only people we're willing to sacrifice for are our spouses and our children. What about the family of God that you are part of? And by the way, the family of God is eternal. The biological family is not. Your wife is not going to be your wife forever. Till death. And then it's finished. Amen? In heaven? <laughs> Pastor Chris, I wish we could spend it together, but you may be living one planet and I'm living somewhere else. <laughs> It won't matter, though. It won't matter because things will be so transformed back then. These things that we, that we are so, will, will really not matter. But the truth is, what we prize right now in terms of our family and that we give our life for and we do all, this is very temporary. The spiritual family you're part of is eternal. It is the church. It is his family of which Jesus is the head and Jesus is the groom. It is this church that is his bride that will last forever. So how can you neglect that which is eternal and give all your attention to that which is temporal and feel you're doing God's will? Go to verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18. My little children, let's everybody say this. Say this. Let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, Get ready to give in concrete ways your time, your talent, your treasure. Get ready to share that with other members of his family. That is how you love God. And that's how you practically make him first. So if you still want to prioritize God and then your family, understand what it means to make God first. It's not just words. It means laying down your life, sacrificing as Christ did for his family. 
You cannot love God whom you cannot see. If you are not willing to love his family whom you do see. Thank God for the biological families he gave us. Pastor Chris traveled this weekend, and I don't know how she manages when I go, and she, she's by herself, because I missed her. Thank God for that biological family. Please take care of your wife. Take care of your husband. Take care of your children. But don't act as though those children and your spouse always comes first in every decision, and your your goal is to always seek their interest and only their interest at the expense of the interest of God's family. There's a way to do both. There's a way to do both. So let me quickly bring you to a conclusion that I hope will help you. If this hierarchy doesn't really work because of what Jesus clearly states that if we don't hate father, mother, brother, sister, uh, we can't be his disciple. Now, for those suggesting in case, I may be assuming that everybody understands when Jesus is using the word hate here, he's not saying you should be hate in the sense that we would ordinarily understand it. He's talking about in comparison to him and what he's called you to do, they are such a far second. I mean, Jacob, I love and Esau, I hate it. In other words, I chose Jacob over Esau. If you got to choose, what he's saying is, if you're going to be his disciple, you've got to choose him over all of these other things, and you need to do it every time. So let me conclude with this. How do I, how do you, how should we set priorities? How should we determine priorities? Let's read first, let's read Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1, 17 to 18. Colossians 1, 17 to 18. Let's read together. And he is before, who's the he? Jesus. He is before all things, and in him, things in him, all things consist. Next verse. And he is the head of the body or the family, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have what? The preeminence. That's the New King James. Now let me read it in the, the, the NCV. It says this. He was there before anything was made, and all things continue because of him. He is the head of the body, which is the church. Everything comes from him. He is the first one who was raised from the dead. So in all things, Jesus has the first place. Listen, if you're going to prioritize, here I believe is the biblical priorities. Jesus occupies first place, second place, third place. Fourth place, in all things, he is the priority. In all things, in all my relationships, in everything I do, he has the preeminence. In everything I do, he occupies the first place. In everything I do, Jesus comes First. So, how do I translate that? In my relationship to God, Jesus first. In my relationship to God, what I seek to do is to exalt Christ and to please him in that relationship. He's first. In my relationship, if I put my family second, okay, Christ is first. In all that I do in this family, my priority, my responsibility is to make sure he is first. My children know he is first. My spouse knows he is first. My money knows he is first. My time knows he is first. Are you hearing me? He is first. My responsibility is to glorify him in this family. 
and to make sure that he occupies the preeminent position and everything I do, I do with this in mind that he might be glorified in my family and through my family. And then when it comes to my relationship to my church family, his family, the same rule applies. Jesus first. My desire as I relate to my family, my number one responsibility, in fact, it was as my own responsibility, is to make sure that Christ is glorified through me and through my relationship with my church family. Christ is first. I want to conduct myself towards the members of my family in a way that Jesus is glorified. Jesus is pleased. Jesus is first. So when I'm thinking about acting up and withdrawing from ministry, I got to say, okay, does that make Jesus first? Is, is that how I should relate if Jesus is first? Will this glorify Jesus? Will this enable me and my church to glorify Christ? If I decide, you know what, I'm not going to give anymore to support the mission of the church because I want to spend all my money doing these things for me or my family. How is Christ glorified in the church? How is Christ glorified through the church if everybody did what you did? It's easy. Stop prioritizing God, family, church, others, or God, church, family, others, because when you put the church first, you could end up neglecting your family. If you put your family first, you end up neglecting the church. You know what? I don't think that's how God wants you to do it. In all things, Christ has priority. So just make it one thing. Jesus is first place. Jesus, second place. Jesus, third place. Jesus, fourth place. In every relationship, this is my purpose. This is my plan that Christ be glorified through this relationship. Christ be glorified and exalted through my family. Christ be glorified and exalted through my church family. Christ be glorified and exalted in my business. Christ be exalted. And I don't have to neglect one for the other. He hasn't given us the permission to neglect one for the other. He calls us to glorify him in all things. I pray this message helps you. I, Lord willing, if the Lord allows me to, I will continue next week. But I hope this message has helped you establish priorities. Don't buy that humanistic philosophy that we have baptized and we treat as though it's Bible. And a lot of preachers preach this. It's very popular among evangelical Christians. And as a result, so many neglect the family of God and have no problem with it because they feel that God has given them permission to do so. In Jesus' name. So what is the way you set your priorities going forward? Say Jesus first, Jesus second, Jesus third, Jesus alpha, Jesus omega. It's always about glorifying him and pleasing him in every relationship. So in my relationship with my family, my wife, my children, my number one responsibility is to glorify Jesus in it. And, and, and have Jesus glorified through it. In my relationship with the church, it's not, okay, you no, know, I'm a member. You don't have a choice if you're a Christian. I'm a member of this family. It is the family of God. And being a member of this family, my responsibility is to exalt Jesus and to do everything as he enables me to, that Christ may be glorified through this family. If you operate, you will know what to do. If you just make Jesus, if that is, you will make the right decisions. You will know when you're doing too much one way or the other. God bless you. If you're watching online and you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he prioritized you to such a degree that he left heaven, came on earth, went to the cross and died for you. Christ has done it 
all. He wants you to be part of his family. He wants you to spend eternity with him. He has sent out the invitation. Like many in the parable who made excuses, many make excuses every day. I pray for you that right now you will accept the invitation. Receive Jesus into your life. Believe that he died for you. Believe he arose again. Believe he's coming again. Believe that his blood has satisfied the justice of God because it has. And believing that now, simply pray this simple prayer with me. Pray this from your heart. Say, Father God, I thank you for Jesus who died for my sins. Today, I acknowledge my need for the Savior. I cannot save myself. Jesus, I receive you. I receive your salvation. I receive your forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus. I declare you now my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you just pray that prayer, simple words, but God was listening. And because you prayed it from your heart, I want to be the first person to tell you on the basis of his word, your sins are forgiven. You have received the gift of eternal life. Now there's a whole world before you that you need to discover, a brand new relationship with God you've never had before. We want to help you grow in that relationship. So please communicate with us. Use the information that has been provided for you right now to get in touch with us and let us know that you have just received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because we want to help you grow in this relationship. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise.